So this is part one of our chapter seven lecture series. Chapter seven is all about the cost of resources. So you will recall that when we covered chapter five, um, our chapter on elasticity, we focused on how firms can maximize revenue. So that's this lower portion of our circular flow diagram here. We know the amount of revenue that a firm brings in depends on the value of the goods and services that they're selling. So again, we learned that to calculate total revenue, you simply do price times quantity, the price of the good that you are selling multiplied by the actual units that you are selling. Um, and then we learn that to maximize revenue, a firm is going to charge a price that's equivalent to where demand is unit elastic. In this chapter, we're now focusing on the top portion of our circular flow diagram. In other words, we know that in order for firms to produce those goods and services, they need to acquire resources. So they acquire different levels of land, labor, and capital, and then they have to pay for those resources. And whatever is left over, that is the profit for the firm. So again, the cost of the land, labor, and capital, we refer to that as the cost of production for the firm. And then again, whatever is left over, that is the profit margin for the firm. So again, businesses have to sell their goods and services to the households to generate the revenue. They then use that revenue to pay for their resources and whatever's left over is profit. Now, although we learned how a firm maximizes revenue in Chapter 5, the ultimate goal of the firm is to actually maximize profits. In other words, how can they maximize their revenue while minimizing their costs in order to have the highest profit margin possible? So the amount of profit that a firm brings in is going to be dependent upon A, how many units the firm is producing, um, B, what is the quantity of resources that you're utilizing in order to produce that output and then see what is the actual cost of those resources that you are utilizing to produce your output. And again, the firm wants to produce the output at the lowest possible cost. So the first thing that we want to do is actually compare all the different levels of output that a firm is able to produce using varying levels of resources. So for this particular lecture, I'm going to be focusing on just production, not the actual costs of production. Um, so you'll want to refer to the appendix to chapter 7 for this information. So let's say that my hypothetical firm that I'm talking about is an airline. Um, and so we know that what an airline produces is passenger airline miles. In other words, they produce a service. They get people from point A to point B. Um, so that's what this schedule of information is reflecting, is all the different levels of airline passenger miles that an airline could produce depending on how many resources they're using. So just to keep it simple, we're going to assume that this airline only utilizes two resources. Um, a, they use planes, so that's what you see going down the columns of data, the number of airplanes that the firm utilizes. So they can utilize anywhere from five airplanes, uh, which we see over here, all the way over to 40 airplanes over here. And then, of course, to keep the planes running, we need to have mechanics. So that's what we see going across the rows is how many mechanics the firms can acquire. So they can have anywhere from um, one mechanic all the way up to seven mechanics. And of course, we can see that depending on the number of mechanics that they hire, that allows them to vary the amount of passenger airline miles that they can fly. The same thing with the number of planes. So it's the combination of the number of mechanics that we hire and the number of airplanes that we utilize that tell us how much maximum output this firm can produce. So again, we see that if we only hire one mechanic and have five airplanes, we'd be able to produce 30,000 airline passenger miles. Whereas if we have five airplanes, but we decide to hire four mechanics instead of one, we can increase the amount of passenger airline miles to 130. So again, that's what each one of these squares within our production schedule is showing us is the maximum amount of output that we can produce based on, you know, the number of mechanics in relation to the number of airplanes that we acquire. 
Now, one thing that we notice when we are looking at our schedule of production is that we can get the same level of output or roughly the same level of output just by varying the number of resources that we utilize. So one example I see is that if we hire three mechanics and have 10 airplanes, we can produce 360 airline passenger miles. So that would be right here. However, if we decrease the number of mechanics that we have to two, but increase the number of airplanes that we have to 15, we can actually get the same amount of output. We can get 360,000 airline passenger miles using that combination of resources also. So the question facing the firm is, which combination do we choose? Do we hire three mechanics and acquire 10 airplanes, or do we hire two mechanics and acquire 15 airplanes? Um, well, obviously, the first thing that's going to come to mind is, well, which one has the lowest cost? That would be the one combination that you would want to choose. However, before we can even reach that decision, we have to know whether we are making a decision for the short run versus the long run. Now, in economics, the short run versus the long run is not a specific period of time. It has to do with how long it takes to vary your capital resources. So think of our example in the airline. In other words, if we were only using the two resources, mechanics and airplanes, well, we know that the variable resource, the resource that we can change at any time, would be the labor, the number of mechanics that we have. In other words, I can hire and fire people every single day. So that is what we would refer to as a variable resource. However, in the short run, firms also have fixed resources, which are generally going to be your capital resources. In other words, in our airline example, our capital is the airplane. And unlike the number of mechanics, which I can vary every single day, I cannot vary the number of airplanes that I have every day. In other words, I cannot go from having 10 airplanes to 15 airplanes overnight. It's impossible for me to physically build five more airplanes overnight. Um, so in other words, in the long run, we know that we can acquire more airplanes. So that's why we say that the firm may consider any and all combinations of resources in the long run. So we generally refer to that as the planning period. Um, but the short run is just the period that is just short enough that at least one of your resources cannot be changed. So again, let's say that um, it would take us an entire year to put in an order to acquire more airplanes from the time that we order them to the time that we receive them and they are cleared to fly, then that would mean any time period within one year would be considered the short run. And any time period after that we would call the long run because that's when we can actually vary all of our resources. So again, when in economics, there is no specified short run versus long run time. It all depends on how long it takes the firm to vary their capital resources. And that's going to um, you know, depend on what type of business we're talking about and what type of capital resources we're talking about. So let's say for our airline example, we're making a short run decision. We're trying to decide how much output we are going to be producing within this year. Well, then the only combinations we can look at are dependent upon the amount of fixed capital that we have. So assuming that our airline currently has 10 airplanes, what that means is that those now become the only combinations of output that we can look at. In other words, all of the other combinations don't mean anything to us because, again, we don't have 15, 20, 25, 30 planes in the short run. We only have 10 planes. So now when we're making our decision as to how much output we want to produce, we know that we can only look at these combinations. We can vary the number of mechanics to alter our output. However, we cannot vary the number of planes because we are making a short run decision.
Now, generally, I just refer to the level of, you know, the quantity of output that we produce as just that, just output in the short run versus the long run. However, when you read the appendix to Chapter 7 regarding production, you'll note that they refer to output as total physical product. So the definition of total physical product, or TPP, is just the maximum output that can be produced when successive units of a variable resource are added to a fixed amount of the other resource, sometimes called total product, or again, I generally just refer to it as output. But I just don't want you to become confused when you see the term total physical product in your textbook reading, and then I'm always just using the term output. Um, those words can be used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. So again, looking back at, back at our original schedule, each one of these squares within our production schedule is illustrating a different level of total physical product. So again, if I decide to hire two mechanics, that means that the maximum amount of output I can produce would be 250. If I decide to hire six mechanics, the total amount of output I can produce is 540. So again, we can see that as I acquire more variable resources, or in this case mechanics, I can increase or decrease the amount of total physical product that my firm is able to produce. Now again, since we're making a short run decision, what I want to do is make another out production schedule with only the information for the 10 airplanes. So that's what I've done here. In other words, now I'm looking at my production schedule with just the amount of output that I'm able to produce with the 10 airplanes that I currently have because I don't need to look at the entire production schedule because all of those other levels of output are irrelevant to me because, again, I only have 10 airplanes. So I only want to look at the output combinations that I'm able to produce based on the fixed amount of capital that I have, which, again, is 10 airplanes. So, again, what we see is that as I vary the number of mechanics going from zero all the way up to eight, I can vary the amount of output that I produce. So going from not, no output whatsoever and then up to eight mechanics, I get to 540. And then in economics, just like with everything, we can graph that data. So I can have what I call my total physical product curve or my output curve, which is showing me the total amount of output that I'm able to produce depending on how many mechanics that I hire. So I have the mechanics on this axis down here, I have the total amount of output I can produce over here, and then I just go ahead and plot those points. Now what we notice as I'm plotting the data is that the points of output are getting closer and closer together as I acquire more mechanics. Um, so again, initially the output accelerates and then it starts to decelerate. In other words, the amount of additional output I'm getting as I hire more and more mechanics is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until ultimately it starts to decline. So again, notice that going from one to two mechanics mechanics, I get an additional um, 150 units of output. When I go from three to four mechanics, I'm only getting 80 additional units of output. In other words, the difference between 360 and 440. When I go from five to six mechanics, I'm only getting 40 additional units of output. So again, I get 150 right here. I only get 80 here and then I only get 40 down here. So again, you can clearly see the amount of additional output I'm getting is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually going from seven to eight mechanics, I actually lose output. My output goes from 550 to 540, so it's actually negative 10. In economics, we refer to that as what we call diminishing marginal returns. The law of diminishing marginal returns basically states that when successive equal amounts of a variable resource are combined with a fixed amount of another resource, marginal increases in output that can be attributed to each additional unit of the variable resource will eventually decline. 
So again, think of our example we were using with airplanes and mechanics. In other words, why can't we just continue to add more and more mechanics, you know, hire more and more mechanics, and think that we can continue to get the same incremental increases in output? Well, the reason that we had the law of diminishing marginal returns is because we are talking about A, a short run scenario. So diminishing marginal returns only applies in the short run. And B, what we're dealing with in the short run is fixed resources. So in other words, the reason why we can't just keep hiring more and more mechanics and get the same amount of output is because there's only so many planes for the mechanics to work on because we are dealing with fixed resources in the short run. So sure, we can hire more and more mechanics. However, the amount of additional output we're going to get per me mechanic is eventually going to decline because, again, there's only so much work for them to do on the fixed capital. And again, until we reach that eighth mechanic, notice that our output started to decline. We can assume then that the mechanics are actually starting to get in each other's way and make each other less productive. Now the law of diminishing returns is much clearer to examine when, you, when we look at what's called the average physical product and the marginal physical product. So again, what I gave you in this schedule is just total physical product. In other words, the total amount of output that the firm is able to produce depending on how many variable resources they acquire. If we want to just know on average how much output we're getting per variable resource, we just simply take the total amount of output and divide it by the number of variable resources that we acquire. So again, let's say I wanted to know what the average physical product was when I have three mechanics. I would simply take the total physical product, which is 360, and divide it by the number of variable resources, which is three mechanics. So I see my average physical product is 120 units of output. So on average, when I hire three mechanics, I'm getting 120 units of output per mechanic. If I want to know the marginal physical product, then that means I actually want to know what is the additional amount of output I'm getting when I acquire that last resource. So for marginal physical product, you have to take the change in the output and divide it by the change in the number of variable resources. So again, let's say I want to know what the marginal physical product is of just that third mechanic. Well, I need to take the change in the output. So notice that I went from having 250 to 360. So you're just taking the difference between those two numbers, 360 minus 250, divided by the change in the number of resources. Again, I went from having two mechanics to three mechanics. So I would just take the difference between those numbers also. So 360 divided by, or 360 minus 250 is 110, divided by three minus two, which is one. Therefore, the marginal physical product of the third mechanic would be 110 units of output. So again, we see how we're able to calculate average physical product versus marginal physical product. Average is just telling us on average how much each mechanic is giving us, whereas marginal is just telling us the actual incremental increase in output we're getting when we acquire that last variable resource. The last thing we want to understand is the relationship between the marginal and average product for a particular good. Um, and this is also going to apply when we talk about our cost functions. Um, but basically, when the marginal physical product is greater than the average physical product, that means the average physical product is going to be increasing. Whereas if the marginal physical product is below the average physical product, the average physical product will be uh, decreasing. Um, and one shortcut that I always tell students to, to kind of remember the relationship between these two is to think about your GPA, how you have an overall GPA, which would be your overall average, and then you also get a GPA every semester you're in school, which would be like your incremental GPAs. So think of your cumulative GPA as your, at your overall average, so that would be like your average physical product for your cumulative GPA, 
and then your semester GPA, the one you get, you know, that changes from semester to semester, that's your marginal. So that would be like the marginal physical product. So think about what happens when your overall, when your semester GPA is less than your overall average. So again, if your overall average was a 3.0, but this semester you only got a 2.0, what does that do to your overall average? Well, it brings it down. So again, whenever your marginal physical product is less than your average physical product, the average physical product is going to fall, just like when your marginal GPA is less than your marginal or your cumulative GPA, your cumulative GPA is going to fall. And then vice versa. Let's say that your overall GPA is a 3.0, however, this semester you got a 4.0. Well, you know that's going to cause your overall average GPA to rise. Um, so again, um, you know, oftentimes this is, makes it very easy for students to remember the relationship between marginal and average product when they think about it in terms of their marginal versus overall GPA. So to quickly review, um, marginal physical product is basically going to be D, the additional output produced from one more unit of a variable resource holding other inputs cons uh, constant. Um, one thing whenever I tell students, whenever you see the word marginal, um, just think of increments or additional. In other words, marginal is always going to be the incremental or additional change in something. Uh, suppose I gave you this problem. Uh, four workers can harvest 20 bushels of corn on an acre of land per day, while five workers can harvest 25 bushels. So again, listening to that problem, you can identify what the fixed resource is, the variable resource is, and the output. The output is going to be the corn, the fixed resource is, is going to be the acre of land, and the variable resource is going to be the number of workers. Um, so I want your brain to start thinking in that manner. When you're reading something, start to identify what the different components of the problem are. What are their fixed resources, variable resources versus output for the firm? Um, but again, uh, reading that question, wanting to know which one of these would be correct, the only correct answer here would be B. The marginal physical product of the fifth worker is 5, because remember, marginal physical product is the change in the output divided by the change in the quantity of resources. So we went from having 20 units of output to 20, uh, 25, so you take the difference between those numbers and then divide it by the number, uh, the change in the number of workers. We went from having four four workers to five workers, so you take the difference between those. So 25 to minus 20 is going to be 5, 5 minus 4 is going to be 1, so we come up with 5. So again, 5 indeed is the marginal physical product. And then the second part of that answer says the average physical product of five workers is 5. So again, average physical product is just where you take the total physical product, which in this case is 25, and divide it by the number of variables resources that you have and we have five workers so 25 divided by 5 we do indeed come up with 5 therefore the only correct answer would be B and then the last review question I have is which of the following does not refer to diminishing marginal returns now remember diminishing marginal returns only applies in the short run when you have fixed resources. That's why your output diminishes because you don't have all resources that are variable. So basically what you're trying to identify is which one of these scenarios isn't dealing with fixed resources. If it's dealing with fixed resources then that means it's a short run scenario which means diminishing returns does apply. So A says application of increasing amounts of fertilizer to a field of corn. Well, we know that a field of corn, a field itself is fixed, right? There's only a, you know, let's say it's an acre, you can't increase the size of the field. So we know that that indeed does apply to diminishing returns, so that cannot possibly be the correct answer. B says increasing number of seat belts in an automobile. Well, the size of an automobile is fixed. In other words, we can't just keep adding more and more seat belts to one car and think it's going to make it safer. So diminishing returns applies to that scenario. 
closing part of a restaurant because of lack of servers. Again, a restaurant is a fixed amount of capital in the short run, so that is going to be diminishing returns. Um, let me underline these so we understand. Uh, D says increasing the number of vice presidents as the size of the firm increases. Okay, so we have the number of people that work for the firm increasing while the actual size of the firm is increasing. So in this scenario, there is no fixed resource. Therefore, the law of diminishing returns um, would not apply. So that would actually be the correct answer. Because again, when we look at E also, increasing the number of students in one classroom, again, the size of the classroom is fixed, which means diminishing returns does apply.